Hospice. It's composed of one person, me. I started it in January of 2014 after having spent a number of years as the managing director of the New Orleans Business Council. Uh, my primary areas in this consulting practice, which is still uh, a baby still in the cradle, is in organizational development, conflict resolution, and strategic planning. And that's the kind of work that I'm spending a good deal of my time doing these days. He was the former, as he just mentioned, managing director of the Business Council of New Orleans and the River Region. He coordinated and managed relationships with elected officials and governmental bodies and civic groups, developed and executed initiatives of the executive committee, the board of directors, and compiled and analyzed as well as presented research aimed to supporting the organization's goals and priorities. He joined the Business Council in 2007. He served as Vice Chancellor, Governmental Community and Diversity Affairs at the University of New Orleans, Louisiana's public urban university. In 1996, Brown was designated by Chancellor Gregory O'Brien to lead the university's first ever comprehensive capital campaign raising more than $150 million in resources for endowed chairs and professorships, facilities, scholarships, and other trusted programs. He also currently holds higher education post on the Board of Trustees for Loyola University of New Orleans. And he's a gubernatorial appointee of the Louisiana Community and Technical College System Board of Supervisors. He serves on numerous community and civic boards, including the Council for a Better Louisiana, the New Orleans Police and Justice Foundation, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, the Foundation for Science and Mathematics Education, and is a trustee for the Greater New Orleans YMCA. He has been honored with a role model award from the Young Leadership Council, was selected as a community hero slash Olympic torchbearer for the 1996 Summer Olympics. And in 2007, he was honored with the Time Speaking Union Loving Cup for Community Service, an individual award extended annually to an outstanding New Orleans citizen since 1901. For more than 22 years, he was a high school and college basketball referee and officiated in the NAIA National Championship Tournament in 1994, 95, and 96. He's received a Bachelor of Arts degree, magna cum laude, in history from Park College and in, 19, in 1975, and a Master's of Arts degree in Human Resource Management from Pepperdine University in 1979. He is a native of Franklinton, Louisiana, but resides in the city of New Orleans. So how about a round of applause for Bob Brown? <laughs> well, far be it from me to kind of conduct you in a, a class, but tell us a little bit more about this current uh, scope of work that you're, you're doing, and uh, tell us what's going on in the city of New Orleans and how you want our students to be engaged with our city right now. Well, on the, on the scope of work, it just so happens that the first contract that I got uh, when I started this practice, and I actually had begun to work on it in August of 2013, doing all of the paperwork and putting the, the uh, Secretary of State documents together and getting a tax ID and all of that, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a contract at another university. It's called Davenport University. It's in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That institution was creating a new college of education, not unlike the College of Education here at the University of New Orleans. It was being started by a man who had been the associate dean of the College of Education here at UNO. His name is Dr. Andre Perry, and Dr. Perry asked me if I would do some, stri uh, some strategic planning work for him as he created this new enterprise. And so I did. I went to Grand Rapids. We did uh, what I thought was fruitful work. And uh, I was actually launching my business even before I had left my previous uh, position. Uh, I also do some consulting work for the Business Council, which was my employer up until December. And that keeps me fairly busy uh, as well. And I have a few other pies in the oven, as I call them. These are proposals that I've submitted that haven't yet been decided as to whether or not I'm going to get the work. I'm confident that I will get at least some of this, and we'll just have to wait 
uh, and see. So let's take it from um, education, where you're talking about right now some of your consulting work. Um, let's also talk about it from the standpoint that you know you spend a number of years in higher ed, obviously right here on this on this campus. Um, what does education in New Orleans uh, look like to you, and um, what does the University of New Orleans look like to you right now? To a bunch of folks that are putting their investment in a university and expecting to take these pieces of pa paper and go on and do something. Yeah, I think you have to I think you have to separate the answer to this question into two parts. First, having to do with K through 12 education in the city, which is big and different from the way it is in nearly, not nearly every other city in America, more than different than every other city in America. There is more charter school density in New Orleans than in any other city in the United States. Nearly every public school in this city, and there are 34,000 kids in public schools in the city of New Orleans, is a charter school, whether it's chartered by the Orleans Parish School Board or the, uh, the state chartering uh, agency. And, and that's a promising landscape, in my opinion. Kids, are, the scores are increasing. Uh, the rates of discipline, uh, for the most part, are, are down. Suspensions, uh, expulsions, and the like are, are not as, as, uh, uh, as high as they were. Graduation rates are climbing. They're not where they, sh where they should be, but kids are graduating uh, at higher rates. And some of the schools which have been problem schools in some neighborhoods where you might expect, uh, given the socioeconomic uh, uh, s situation there, some of those schools are making some remarkable, remarkable gains. So from on the K-12 K through landscape, I think things are promising, and we all hope that they will they will stay that way. In public higher education, uh, in general, these have been tough years the last uh, eight or 10 years. And the, since 2008, since 2008, the public landscape for higher education has been cut by $700 million. Seven hundred million in cuts since two thousand and eight, and by cuts, what I mean to say is that that's the money that the state taxpayers pump into higher education to subsidize the cost of the tuition that you pay. As a result of that, what colleges and universities have been doing, as you probably know, if you're a sophomore, a junior, or a senior, is bumping the tuition rates that you pay year upon year. They don't give you, in most cases, any more or better services for it, although I hope your services are acceptable already. You know, things are good, admissions is okay, the registrar works fine, financial aid is cool, the library, everything works. We know that. Uh, the maestro here teaches an extraordinary class and that when you leave here, you will, if you didn't walk in brilliant, be brilliant in every respect. We know that. So we know the, the quality of what goes on uh, in this room. But generally speaking, I would hope that it has remained the same. But you have paid more money for it. You paid more money for it. And it's very difficult to improve services when you're just trying to get the bills paid and in fact, when you're doing it by raising the rates that you have to pay to, uh, to attend this university. So it's kind of a mixed bag on that score. And by the way, I don't think that's going to change in the near future. I, I, I don't think that times are going to get good uh, all, of a, all of a sudden. Having said that, though, uh, and I know uh, the, the chancellor, or not chancellor, he's now president. It was a chancellor when I was working here, but that same position uh, as the chief executive officer for a university is now the president uh, at this institution, uh, has, has tried extremely hard to keep the quality of what happens in the classroom, which is the main thing, after all, uh, that happens here, to keep the quality of what happens in the classroom as good as it's ever been. 
Uh, I can't say with certainty that that's the case because I don't work here anymore. You have more to say about that than I do because you're students here and you're taking 9, 12, 15 hours, whatever number of hours it, that you're taking. And so you can, you can do a better job of answering that question. But I am, I am hopeful for UNO. Enrollment is up this year for the first time in about five years. It's not a lot, but it's up. So UNO in this semester will have on the order of about 12,000 students. Uh, when, but when I was here and before Katrina struck us and everybody, even young people nowadays, live uh, a life that was before and after Katrina. When I was here at UNO, we were 17,200 and some odd students and climbing. We would have been, without Katrina, most folks think, a 20,000 student university, which is probably where we, where we would have topped out at. But enrollment is up a little bit. And if they can stabilize the funding uh, with the state input of money and not have to jack up tuition on you guys again, although I'm not saying that they won't have to, but you hope that they, they, that they don't, and continue to have enrollment creep up, then this will be a healthy university once more. You and I both serve on the Police and Justice Foundation, and you are the vice chairman. Um, Let's talk about crime. We have a new police chief. Um, give us your update as far as you see it, crime in New Orleans, what it means. Uh, and I guess the other thing would be, what can, what can people do and what can students do to assist with the crime issues that we have? Well, crime in this city is an intractable problem. Uh, it causes all of us to fret. Uh, I would be lying if I didn't say, while we're not all in danger, this is not as if if you walk outside of this building or if you leave this campus, you know, you've got to, you've got to be ducking from, from uh, behind one building to behind the, the next bush. It's not that bad. But I would also be lying if I didn't say that this was a place where you must be on your toes and you have to have a certain amount of luck not to be drawn into uh, an unfortunate situation. <clears throat> There are a lot of drugs uh, in this city, not necessarily in this part of the city, but there's a lot of drugs here. Uh, and there are a lot of guns here. And there are a lot of young folk, mostly young black men, who are trafficking in the drug trade and who have access to the guns and who, uh, for reasons that I think certainly give me sleepless nights, can't seem to find or select a better way of dealing with whatever life puts in front of them uh, than A, trying to do some kind of crazy stuff with drugs, and then B, when that doesn't work out to everybody's satisfaction, having the gunplay. We've all seen the stories in the shooting in the French Quarter, woman dead, 21 years old, from, from uh, a young lady from, uh, from Hammond who was shot just had the shooting, I guess it was two weeks ago, where uh, there was the child killed uh, and, and others wounded. I think there were five people wounded in that incident. So we've got, a, we've, we've got, a, we've got problems, uh, and there's no, there's no question uh, about that. Uh, there are two things that make me hopeful, though. One is that there is a drug task force, and you heard uh, Irvin say that he and I served together on the Police and Justice uh, Foundation. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, an urban drug task force that is working extremely hard to break up these horrific game gangs and to take the worst of the bad guys off the street. They just made an arrest over the last four or five days where they, they caught nine of these guys. And these, these, are, these are young black killers. There's no other way to put it. These are young black killers who don't care, it seems, about uh, their lives or, or anybody else's. Uh, but y you, can't, you can't get all of them. And taking nine off the street uh, at once is significant. But there's just a lot of them out there, and there are more where they came from, and young kids grow up into the trade, uh, and so on. But the fact that that task force is at work and, and making some, uh, uh, some big arrest, it makes me hopeful. The second thing is, this is a town where 
job opportunities are about to explode. They are about to explode. Um, we have two new hospitals. I don't know how many of you have driven down either Canal Street or Tulane <coughs> Avenue lately. But if you get a chance to do it, if you have reason to do so, somewhere between here and Claiborne Avenue, drive down either Canal or Tulane. Two humongous hospitals going up. The VA Medical Center and what will be a new LSU, Health Science, LSU Medical Center. The VA Medical Center is gonna hire 2,200 people inside the walls of that hospital. Doctors, nurses, uh, medical techs, uh, lab assistants, and the like. 2,200 people inside the hospital. It's not counting what's gonna happen outside with all of the support work. The LSU hospital is gonna hire around 1,600 new employees. Not quite as many because there's already an LSU hospital functioning and so a lot of those people will just move over into a new, into a new building. But still, 1,600 jobs is a lot of jobs. And many of those jobs, obviously it takes a long time and a lot of work to become a doctor. But you can become a nurse assistant or a nurse within two years. So there's, and since you're already in a university setting, assuming that you would want to do that. By the way, my daughter did her prereqs for nursing here at UNO. And then she went to Delgado and got her uh, degree in nursing and apparently was trained very well. She's a supervisor of a, a nursing facility in uh, just north of Seattle. Uh, she's the nurse manager for a, uh, uh, for a, a nursing unit that has, she has 29 nurses in her unit. There's a lot of people to supervise for a kid that belonged to me. You know, I grew up, I had to slap her around a little bit. <laughs> but, I, but I think that, I, I want to come back to, to the real uh, point, though. I think that, and then there are other opportunities in other areas. There's a lot of construction and a lot of um, uh, fabric, not fabrication, but I'll guess oil and gas production that's happen happening, not inside of New Orleans, but certainly around the city. And so I think if I were a young uh, person moving toward my degree, I would be optimistic, no matter what your degree is in, by the way, doesn't really matter, I would be optimistic about the opportunities that were, that would be coming down the pike as time goes by. What do you think they can do as students to assist with crime? Yeah, that's a good, what can you do to assist with crime? Uh, I'm going to send Nicole uh, and the maestro a link to uh, a website that I just got today. Now, this is about a, a whole series of opportunities to mentor kids in New Orleans. Frankly, it's aimed primarily at boys, not girls. But uh, I certainly don't think that there's any gender barrier to someone who who is willing and able to just share time, attention, empathy, love. I'm your friend and I got your back. Call me when you need to. That can happen between you and anybody, just like it may be happening between you and your little brother or your little first cousin or the kid down the street. So I'm going to send you that, and that's, that's, that's one thing that is tangible, it's concrete, and you can look at it and see whether or not among all of those possibilities you, uh, uh, you find something uh, that's interesting. Uh, on the other hand, this city is full of nonprofits that are reaching out to kids of every description, providing them with all kinds of opportunities. One of the things that you can do one of the things that you can do is you can help kids in a project that's called Turn the Page. Turn the Page. That's a project, by the way, which was conceived, designed, launched, and is now being sustained by 
a guy that I happen to know and respect. His name's Irvin Mayfield. Turn the Page is designed to make New Orleans the most literate city in America by the time of our 300th year anniversary, which will be 2018. And it's all tied to having all of us be helping young kids to become uh, enamored of and to get happiness from reading, from reading. So that one is really close to home because that's his program, and it is wonderful. Uh, I'm going to close my turn the page because this is something that I learned and have lived by practically my entire life. Mark Twain said, a man who will not read is not substantially better off than a man who cannot read. And so I try to take that on as my personal principle, and so I try to be one who reads a lot of something every day. Sometimes it's for fun and entertainment, but often, t and that helps, and that's good f to make you a larger person, but most of the time it's so that I can learn something that I didn't know or understand something that I didn't understand or have a better grasp of something that I didn't have as good a grasp of as I could have. So you can turn the page. I'm a person living in New Orleans, and um, I'm at the university. Or I work a job. You know, I got my family. I got my friends. I have things I like to do for fun. I couldn't tell you who my state senator is. I couldn't tell you who my district council person is, uh, and from when I turn on the news and I watch TV, whatever channel I'm watching, it doesn't seem like I really want to know who they are. Furthermore, it doesn't seem like anything they do has any impact, uh, not in any level of severity, on what I'm doing with my life. Your response to that? Well, <clears throat> At this point in your, in your lives, uh, it, that might be an answer that you can accept. What does my council member or my state representative or my congressperson have to do with my life? Not very much. So it doesn't matter if I know them. It doesn't matter what they do because it all just passes over my head. Well, I'm just going to tell you that's not... That's just not true. I'll give you one example that comes home almost directly and perhaps, if not to every single one of you, to many of you in this room. Many of you have ever heard of a Pell Grant, all right? How about a Stafford Loan? Ever heard that term, Stafford Loan? You've heard that, right? How many of you have ever heard of TOPS? Taylor Opportunity Program for Students. All right, so I named just three programs, right? The first two are federal, and the third one that I named is a state program. A Pell Grant is a, a certain amount, about $1,570, I think, is the maximum right now. More? How much is it, Lynn? The max is $5,700-ish. Oh, yeah. Uh, what did I say? Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. The max is like $5,700, you're right, per year, per academic year now, am I right? You can actually now, that's per academic year, fall and spring, you right. can actually get one for 2000 some odd in, for summer session. For the summer. Mm -hmm. If you qualify for that, that is money that you can get to assist your family in underwriting your education and it doesn't cost you directly a dime. It's free money in that sense, all right? And the whole Pell Grant scheme is now going to be up for reauthorization. You know that your tuition is going up, but you don't know whether or not your Pell Grant allocation will go up. What you do know is that Cedric Richmond, the congressman who represents the district in which 
the University of New Orleans sits, will be one of the 435 members of the Congress who will vote on that. That matters to you. If you get a Stafford loan, and some of you may have taken out loans, which you're going to have to pay that money back, if they change the terms for the Stafford loan, there's been a lot of back and forth about lowering the interest rate mm -hmm. on the loans because the interest rates on, if you borrow money to buy a car or a house, interest rates are pretty low. Mm -hmm. But on a Stafford loan, it's still pretty high. Mm -hmm. And that can turn out to be a lot of money that you have to pay back at relatively steep interest rates. If they can deal with that, then that's going to be the Cedric Richmonds and whoever the, the two senators that represent Louisiana, and right now Mary Landrew and David Vitter. That matters to you. Now, how many of, is there anybody in here who is actually on tops? Is there a tops? Okay, so we have, so you saw the hands that went up, right? If you're not familiar with the tops program, there are three people in this room who are your classmates that you can talk to and find out more about it. If you qualify in the state of Louisiana, and other states have similar programs, if you qualify for the TOPS program coming out of high school, which means a modest GPA, 2.5, and a modest set of core courses that you're required to take, you can bring that portfolio to any public university in Louisiana and get all of your tuition paid. Still got to buy your books and pay your fees and all of that kind of stuff. But your tuition is taken care of. Does that matter to you? I think it does. And the, 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 the state senator for this district, J.P. Morrell, and the state representative for this district, who was currently Jared Brossett, who just won a, a seat on the city council, would be the ones who would make the decisions in the state legislature that have to do with the TOPS program. So in a space of maybe six or seven minutes, I've given you three financial reasons why knowing your elected representative uh, makes a certain kind of sense. And it's not about the maestro. It's not about me. Our days are done. Our student loans are paid off. It's about you. And so that's my example. How do you define success? Well, uh, I, I, find, I define success, I think there are two aspects to it. The first and most important one for me personally, and, and for, for most people who I admire and respect, has to do with a sense of inner happiness with things the way they are. Uh, look, I've got bills to pay. I've got a mortgage. I've got a car that in October will be 20 years old. <laughs> I got reasons to worry, but I look for ways to find a certain coming to terms with all of that stuff that uh, I have to deal with. My shoulder's been giving me trouble for the last few days. Can't work out the way I want to. But I, I look for ways to find, find a certain measure of, of, of satisfaction with the way things are. And I've had some huge disappointments. I won't even go into that because it would, it would make you would be moping for the next three days if I told you about the di disappointments that I have. But I look for ways to find uh, a certain measure of happiness every single day, and most days I'm lucky enough to get that. So that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is having other people think well of me. Other people who, if they think about it at all, or if they mention it to someone else at all, they say, you know, that guy's not a jerk. He's, he's pretty okay. That's important to me. And so in order to not be considered a jerk, and in order for people to say he, he's an okay guy, you have to behave in a certain way. You have to 
treat people in a way that shows that you like them, respect them, appreciate them, value them, uh, and you have to interact with them in a way that that is perceptive, doesn't get on their nerves, doesn't punch the wrong button, doesn't say stuff that is so outrageous and so stupid that you say, well, man, what's wrong with, with this guy? What is he on? And so if I can manage those two parts of my life, and thus far I've been doing enough to at least get by, then life for me is good. I feel good about myself uh, for reasons that matter, not just because I some kind of think I'm so, so hot on my smarty pants and, and all of that, uh, and, and generally speaking, have others uh, think well of, well of me uh, as well. So if I can manage those two pieces, uh, then I, I have success. You work for what people consider arguably the most powerful group, most powerful board, most powerful collection of individuals in one room for several years known as the New Orleans Business Council. Titans of several different industries uh, with the exceptions, exception, I guess, of the legal industry for the most part. That's right. right. Uh, but from sports to shipping to a various array of businesses. Yeah, banking, banking manufacturing. Guys who businesses are hundreds of millions of dollars to billions of dollars with a few folks of assets worth billions mm -hmm. uh, sitting around talking and then expecting you over a number of years to keep them together uh, to fulfill the vision that they put in place. Um, Normally, we when you've come to the class before, we've had more discussions about the shadow government and that kind of a, <laughs> that kind of a thing. But yeah. I'm actually more interested to know now. Um, what did you learn? What's the What's the number one thing walking away after all those years, getting to know these guys, who some of whom you've known for years, but obviously in a very intimate way. The takeaway after all those years of working with some of the most powerful people in the state, in the world, in our city. Well, my biggest takeaway, and I have to be honest, it, 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 I, I'm in some ways uh, amazed at it at this very minute. My biggest takeaway was that people who were this rich, this powerful, and this smart could have such a deep interest in making New Orleans, and general New Orleans specifically, but generally our community, a healthier place. Um, we, as Irvin said, we had the Saints, the Pelicans, Bollinger Shipyards, all of the big banks, Chevron, Shell, all of them were represented in that room. And every single one of those men and women could uh, have easily been spending their time lying on the beach in the south of France if they had chosen to do that. And maybe sometimes they did every <laughs> once in a while. But generally speaking, they put so much energy into the work that, that we did I was really impressed by that. And they put their money where their mouth was. The membership dues at the New Orleans Business Council is $14,000 a year. Every member, 71 of them, wrote a check for 14 grand. Didn't get a penny of it back. They didn't do business in the Business Council setting. In other words, they weren't trading business cards and cutting deals and saying, hey, look, I'm going to make a, you know, a $30 million loan. Let me call you next week, and we'll get together, let's say, a banker and a, uh, the guy, uh, Boise Bollinger at Bollinger Shipyard. They didn't do any of that. Everything was focused on making this a healthier place. And that was amazing to me. I'm not sure if I were that rich, powerful, and smart, that I would have done that. I hope that I would, but I'm not, I, I can't be 
certain that I, that I would. That was, my, that was my biggest takeaway from that. And I guess tied to that, you know they're all type A. They're all like in charge of everything and all actually in charge of me. I never, I never lost sight of the fact that I worked for them. They had great respect for me. They valued my opinion. They thought I was a smart guy and all of that uh, as their managing director. And I was the face of the organization. But I always made sure that I would, was telling myself that I wasn't the organization, that I worked for them. And that helped me to, to be, generally speaking, to be uh, successful. What's your favorite word? Happiness. What's your least favorite word? Hate. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh, I, am, I am moved by both spiritually and emotionally, I guess I would say. I am moved almost equally by music, any kind of music, frankly, uh, and by reading the written word. What turns you off? <clears throat> I'm turned off by, by people who, who choose not to respect and value other people. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> well, man. <laughs> Do I have to? What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Can it be two words? I guess that would be, oh, shit. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Um, I love the sound of a waterfall. What sound or noise do you hate? Um. Uh, the sound of screeching tires. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Other than my own? I'd like to be a singer. <laughs> what profession would you like not to do? I'd like not to do. Doctor. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome. All right, we open the floor for questions for Bob Brown. Yes, what's your name? Christopher. Christopher. That's my son's middle name. Yeah. Uh, next one already. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, for the future in Louisiana, where do you see the biggest job growth? That's a good question. Biggest what job growth. I, I think it's going to be in two. Uh, places, Christopher. First is going to be in anything related to the medical profession, particularly south of I-10. It's mostly in New Orleans, but not only in New Orleans. So that's, that's one area. If you do anything that's, if, if you are in any kind of uh, discipline that's tied to the medical profession, uh, your outlook is bright. The second is going to be uh, in, uh, in the short run, three, seven, nine years, it's going to be in uh, commercial construction, building big things, and in running various kinds of uh, plants related either to the oil and gas industry or the chemical industry. Still, and then again, mostly south of I-10. There's a plant in Lake Charles, it's coming online right now. I want you to write this down. S-A-S-O-L, Sasol. Google that up and read about it. That is going to be on the order of a $17 billion enterprise. One plant. 
17 billion with a B. So they're going to, they first of all need all of the uh, welders and carpenters and, and fabricators and electricians who are going to build this enormous plant. And then, of course, they're going to have to have people to operate it. There are three or four more like that closer to where we are in Donaldsonville, Geismar, and, uh, and, and places close, closer to us. So in those two areas, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. That's where it's, that's where it's going to be. Now, I'll, I'll close with this. When big things like that happen, there's always some ancillary ripple that comes out of it. So you get more people in, doing more of that kind of work, making nice money, they buy more trucks. They go on more vacations. They buy a bigger house. They send their kids to private school. You know, all of those things that tend to churn the economy uh, will happen, and it's going to happen big time, and it's not make-believe, it's coming. And, and you were next. What's your name? Debbie. Deb That's my daughter's name. <laughs> My daughter's name is Deborah Ann Brown. D-E-B-O-R-A-H. Okay. Come on, Debbie. Um, what inspired your love of reading? It's funny. I, 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 I almost don't know. I can tell you this little story, though, and bear with me uh, and let me know if we kind of push through on the time, especially since I showed up late. I grew up in a little town... Uh, which at that time was segregated. And so the black people in that town had a library that was smaller than this room, not the main library downtown, but a much, much smaller library. And that library was only open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 till 2. And I can remember as a boy, seven, eight, nine years old, going to that library and reading as many books as I could read, uh, as, which was about as many as I could put in the little basket on my, on my bike and ride home with. And in those days, when you checked a book out of the library, there was a card in, in the back uh, cover, and you would pull the card out, sign your name to it, and you, they would stamp the date, the librarian would, by which you had to return the book. If you didn't, they charge you two cents for every day the book was overdue. So I went through that reading, and I read voraciously. I read the Leather Stocking Tales. I read all of Zane Gray's uh, novels. I read everything that Dickens wrote that I could get my hands on. Uh, and I would ask my librarian from time to time for books that she would capture from the white library, if I can use that term, the white library, to bring them out. I would get a chance to read them, and then eventually they would go back. By the time I was about 15, I would pull a book from the shelf and get ready to check it out to read it. And when we pulled the card out, I would find my name on there from when I was like 9 or 11. And that was a, that was a thrill to me to see a book that I had already read. I'm giving you a long answer to a short question, but I can't quite explain it. But the written word is, is powerful to me. Last two questions. Uh, let's go with Lynn, and then we'll go with this lady. And I apologize for us only getting two. Thank you. What is the Business Council doing, if anything, to help grow or create small businesses? Women, minority, small, new? Not much directly, Lynn. The Business Council, is, that's not we, what we do directly. But what we do in that domain is to, try to, pro, is to provide support for the people who really do that work and better than we ever could. Two quick examples. The Urban League of Greater New Orleans does remarkable work in helping small businesses to define themselves, invent themselves, and then grow themselves. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a women's empowerment, a women's, women who own small businesses, empowerment 
uh, activity that the Urban League is having, if not this week, next week, and th they do it on a regular basis. Uh, and the Business Council supports the Urban League. They can do that work better than we can. And so our guys have large wallets. The Urban League has great talent. You put the Business Council resources with the Urban League's talent, and you get great out outcomes. That's one example. A second example would be the Idea Village. Heard of, anybody familiar with that? You better Google it, the Idea Village, which creates new entrepreneurs all over uh, the place. And the Business Council provides not only support for the Idea Village and its work, but a number of the Business Council members also serve on the board of the Idea Village. So there's a fair amount of uh, cross-pollination in the work that goes on there. And we said we were only going to do two, but let's do three. Let's do this young lady, and then we'll do the, the young man back there. So go ahead. What's your name? Elizabeth. Okay. Um, what do you see as the biggest hurdle for the city to becoming a healthier place? Mm -hmm. uh, two things, Elizabeth. The first, I've already talked about some, and that's crime. we got to fix it, uh, and I'm hopeful that we will. In the long term, I know we will, because kids are going to graduate, they're going to have aspirations, they're going to go to college, they're going to get jobs, they're going to work, and we're going to change ourselves into a broad culture of, of, uh, of success rather than the culture uh, of dysfunction that we see uh, in, in the crime domain. So that's, uh, that's one thing. The other thing that we've got to get our, our, our arms around is our infrastructure. This is a raggedy town. <laughs> and I love it. It's my, I'm not, you know, you can say that about your own family. <laughs> I like that, Bob. Yeah. So, so if we can, if we can get, the, get our arms around those two things, then we're going to be a great place. And if you move away after you graduate, I promise you, if we get our arms around that, 10 years from now, you're going to be dying to come back. Okay, last one. Said you refereed, right? Yeah. Um, did you ever play? Yeah, I played. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph. I was. Uh, I I spent 20 years in the Air Force, and during that time, uh, I played basketball uh, at the base level, which is about maybe the quality of junior college. It's not, you know, it's not like Duke and North Carolina, but I did that for about uh, 16 years. Uh, when in Europe, I was in Europe in the early 70s, and there's, there's real football in Europe, like you would see at LSU, but not as good. Again, about the junior college level. I played football uh, over there for three years. I wasn't all that good. I was good enough to play at the base level, but I wouldn't call myself uh, a hot shot. But yeah, I did play, and I loved the game, and I love it still. Um, before we dismiss, I want to remind everybody, if you want to come to uh, any of my performances any Wednesday, it's always at 8. And if you see that guy in the black with that My Jazz Is shirt on, uh, just get his number on the way out. You can call him and make sure you get him for free, and he'll make good on that free drink also. And uh, mm -hmm. make sure you guys get your blogs. Any Wednesday where? Uh, I miss that. It's at Urban Mayfield's Jazz Playhouse. Okay. I used to come to the one when you, that you had at the Marriott every Tuesday and Thursday night. I mean, literally, every Tuesday and Thursday night. And we appreciate you for that. Well, I showed up one night and was just close. I was out of town, came back in, and was so disappointed. Well, we still have this other one open, so. <laughs> You're talking about the semester, right? That's correct. Um, so, and make sure you guys get to your blogs. Don't let them pile up. Um, because I have to read these things at the end of the semester, and there's nothing worse than reading the ones that you know what they sound like. When, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like sitting there, so I don't want to have to pay you back for mindless reading at the end of the semester. Let's thank our wonderful <laughs> guest, Bob Brown. <laughs> See y'all next week. If y'all want to come meet Mr. Brown, I'm certain he'd love to chat with y'all. I got no place to go.